Thank you. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for keeping us when we could not keep ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach your word on this historic Sunday in our lives. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer, for reading the scripture for us this morning. The title of the message is, We Are the Ones We Are Waiting For. Last week, Mr. Porter blessed us with the song, My Lord, What a Morning. Well, this morning, I changed the lyrics a bit, if I could, to My Lord, What a Week. What a week. A week of waiting, waiting first to vote, and then waiting and waiting and waiting for the outcome. What a week of waiting for the outcome while I was also waiting for the Lord to speak clearly to my spirit about the message for today. And God did just that with the scripture from the Revised Common Lectionary. The lectionary, as we have shared before, are scriptures that are pre-selected, and there's a cycle of three years of scriptures that were pre-selected, and I went back to find out how long ago these scriptures were pre-selected, and it was 28 years ago that more than 20 denominations came together and pre-selected scriptures for the Sundays of the year for three different years. And this scripture was chosen for this day. God speaking through the prophet Amos saying, I hate, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them and the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. What a scripture for the church universal in America on this Sunday morning, for this morning, after a week of waiting, we should be grappling with the truth that almost half of the country, nearly 71 million people, were not on the side of justice and righteousness. As God demands through Amos, while we were waiting for the outcome of the election, the wait revealed that almost half the country, nearly 71 million people, voted for a man and an administration that separated hundreds of children from their parents, housed them in cages, and admittedly are unable to contact the parents of 545 children therefore rendering them orphans. Almost 71 million people supported a man in one way or another that offended women, the disabled, the military, as well as people of African descent, Mexican descent, Chinese descent, as well as those who identify as LGBTQIA, and frankly, any state with a democratic governor and anyone who was not on his side. This week, we grapple and need to continue to grapple with the truth that nearly 71 million people chose to support a man who refused to unequivocally disavow hate groups and white supremacy groups, but instead told them on national television to stand down and stand by. Stand by until when, we should be asking. This week, we waited and we watched 
And some of us cried and we wondered and we feared that this administration would prevail. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Love overcame hate. And we believe that God is on our side, but hold on not so fast. The truth is that if the victory had gone the other way, many of the 71 million Trump supporters would be saying, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Love, they'd even say, overcomes hate. And God is on our side. My first point in the sermon is we have a dilemma. You see, all across America, people are in church this morning. They're in worship this morning, some very likely in person and some in Zoom, all with music, all with a Bible, all with a preacher and a cross. Some are in blue states and some are in red states. Some are shouting victory and some are angry and may even be plotting in defeat depending on their political reality and all are directing their worship towards God. We have a dilemma this morning. Which group's worship is authentic? Which group's songs are relevant? We have a dilemma if we're singing Amazing Grace and they're singing Amazing Grace, whose reality of grace is truly amazing? If we're praying, thank you, Lord, and they're praying, help us, Lord, whose prayer reaches God? We have a dilemma, a dilemma that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. noticed and named years ago when he stated that 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. And while we waited this week and watched the numbers come in this week, we were reminded that the church is not just segregated by race and ethnicity, we are also very obviously segregated by morality and values such as equality, justice, caring for the poor and the disenfranchised. So while we celebrate this morning, those of us who are celebrating that the wait is over, our celebration is tempered by the fact that the weight revealed to us that we have a dilemma because half our country chose hate, division, mockery, and white supremacy over love, justice, equality, and freedom for all. The weight revealed that we have a dilemma, a dilemma that gives meaning to the words of God through the prophet Amos on today. Hear them again, verse 21, I hate, I despise your festivals. I hate, I take no delight in your assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, God says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. While the prophet Amos was speaking to the children of Israel of that day, the weight revealed to us, it seems, that there are Christians that Amos might say the same to today. When we think of what we witnessed this week, we can understand how God can be disgusted with worship when worship is from the cold hearts that carry out injustice. Listen to the injustice that the prophet Amos calls out among the children of Israel. In Amos 2, he speaks of oppressing the poor, buying and selling and trampling the poor and the needy instead of helping them, denying justice to the poor, collecting of unfair fines from the poor. We'll hear something about that during second hour. Amos in chapter four speaks of wealthy women oppressing the poor and crushing the needy. Amos in chapter five speaks of hating those who uphold justice, detesting honest people and oppressing the innocent and taking bribes. I wonder how many bribes passed hands and will pass hands this week. In chapter Chapter six, Amos speaks of living with complacent attitudes, 
and acting with pride. In chapter eight, he speaks of cheating when selling, boosting prices, and using dishonest scales. The wait last week revealed that many worshiping God today are guilty of the injustices that are parallel with the worshipers of Amos's day. And parallel injustice calls for parallel condemnation. Well, I can't guarantee that the pastors across the sea of red states are preaching from the book of Amos this morning. Even though it's in the lectionary, they have a choice of lectionary text this morning. I wonder how many chose this text. And even if they did choose Amos' text, I can almost guarantee that many are identifying with the need for justice for them. That justice would lead to a Trump victory in the courts. And as they fight, they're fighting the injustice that was done to them. This is a strange phenomenon of our faith, that the same Bible and the same scripture might be a tool for fighting justice and for upholding the opposing injustice. But one thing I know for sure is that I cannot control those churches nor those pastors. And as I learned a long time ago is that when I'm pointing the finger, there are three pointing back at me. We can't control those churches or those Christians, but we can and should take a look at ourselves. One of my favorite quotes credited to Socrates is an unexamined life is not worth living. So let's examine ourselves this morning as the Amos text demands that we do so. We, where are we on the spectrum of care for the poor? Welcoming the stranger, fighting for justice, being anti-racist and loving our neighbor as ourselves. How well do we speak up? in times of injustice? What actions did we take when we heard about the separation of children from their parents at the border? How long did it take us to forget that children are caged and once parented children are now orphans? What are we doing to prevent the killing of unarmed black people by police officers? It keeps happening over and over and over and over again. How many times must it happen before the church demands that justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream? What are we doing to bring equality in health care? How high must the percentage of Black people dying from COVID rise before we realize that we have a crisis in this country that was well here well before COVID-19? I don't know about you, but Amos is helping me today. You see, as I recently told Pastor Sarah, sometimes I get weary, weary of my faith being directly tied to social justice, weary that my relationship with God and Jesus Christ is directly tied to a continual fight for justice. You see, sometimes I feel like the character Sophia in the color purple, Sophia said, all my life I've had to fight. Sometimes I feel like Sophia, why does my faith life have to also be a fight life? And I must admit to you, lately I've wondered and I've been weary and I've lamented that all my life I've had to fight. Why is my faith tied to a fight? But here's how Amos helps me this morning. What point is there in worshiping God in a way that pleases me when God is not pleased? Let me say that again for the people in the back. What point is there in worshiping God in a way that pleases me when God is disgusted? The answer, Amos tells us, is to let justice roll down like waters and, and righteousness like an ever failing stream. It tells me that justice is our first act of worship. 
I feel my help coming. You see, I've been lamenting. Why is my faith tied to a fight? And Jesus said, because if you seek ye first, the kingdom of God, we talked about that in the Lord's prayer, and God's righteousness, everything else I need will be added to me. That's what Jesus said. So my first point is we have a dilemma. And my second point is that justice is the worship that God desires. The church, not just Hyde Park Union Church, the church in general spends significant resources on worship and not enough resources on justice. That's what the weight revealed to us, that if more churches were seeking justice, we might not have to wait so long. And while worship, the music and the robes and the pomp and the circumstance has its place in the life of the believer. Amos is teaching us that and what the weight should have taught us, and that's that God detests our worship on Sunday, November 7th, if justice was not our priority on Tuesday, November 3rd. Justice is the worship that God desires. The best example I can give of this is a ministry that I so admire. It's on the front of your bulletin. It is the ministry of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I discovered something or rediscovered something, Pastor Sarah, that Reverend Dr. King solo pastored only one church. From 1954 to 1960, Martin Luther King Jr. was the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama known as the birthplace. His ministry created the birthplace of civil rights movement. Pastor Sarah, we have something in common with Dr. King because in 1960, he became the co-pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church with his father, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. and remained co-pastor until his death in 1968. And when I think about this ministry, which I and so many admire, this ministry that impacted so many people and nations, this ministry, which is the body of knowledge for civil rights to be studied for years to come, I realize I have no idea what the choir was like at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. I have no idea whether they wore robes or whether they wore plain clothes. I have no idea how many songs they sang and how long the service lasted. History did not record who was allowed to read scripture and nor who read announcements. I have no idea if there was a prelude and a postlude. I have no idea, I kind of think I can guess, but I'm not sure if there was a pipe organ or a Hammond organ. I can't tell you if they had coffee hour after service, I'm not sure if they celebrated Men's Day and Women's Day. I can't tell you how well they gave their tithes and their offering. But I can tell you that their ministry of justice got results. I can tell you that the ministry that they engaged in and they engaged their congregation in through sit-ins and protests and marches and boycotts got results. I can tell you that he met with ministers and lay people, justice organizations, congressmen and presidents and senators and presidents. I can tell you that his ministry, his worship to God got results. For the prophet, the protests, excuse me, and the marches and the boycotts led to the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that gave Black people the right to be treated like a human, a right that should have never required a fight. And this Baptist preacher, Dr. King, and his ministry that only spanned 14 years is an example of worship that pleased God. The night before he was killed, and I'm almost done, Dr. King gave his mantra for his ministry when he said, I just want to do God's will. And what King's ministry is teaching us and Amos's conviction teaches us and Jesus's words teach us is that what the weight should have shown us. And that is that we are the ones 
we're waiting for. See, I'm grateful for the outcome of the election, but we are the ones that we were waiting for. I'm grateful and I'm excited that we made history this election with the first woman, a black woman as vice president of the United States of America, because we are the ones that we're waiting for. And the election may be over and that wait might be over, but I admonish you that we are the ones that we're waiting for. For God calls us as a church to be the church. And to be the church, we must do God's will. We must work for justice as our first act of worship. For that is what God desires. And there is plenty of work to do if we want to get children out of cages. We are the ones that we're waiting for. If we want equality and justice for all people, we are the ones that we're waiting for. If we want to end mass incarceration, the killing of unarmed black people and health disparities, we are the ones we're waiting for. If we want justice for the LGBTQIA community, we are the ones that we're waiting for. If we do God's will and we let justice roll and give God the worship God desires, the prelude will mean that much more. Music to our ears in the midst of a chaotic world, the call to worship will mean that much more, calling us together to center us as one body working for justice. The hymns and the songs will mean that much more, calling us together to center us and, and giving us what we need to feed our souls and our spirits as we fight for justice. The postlude will be icing on the cake as it serves as the music that gives us our marching orders as we leave the sanctuary and we exit to serve. We are the ones we're waiting for. And when God gets the worship God desires, justice will roll down like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. We are the ones, we are the ones. Thank God for the election being over, but we are the ones that we are waiting for. God bless you.